We have uh, two special guests um, who with us today. Uh, one, a former fellow, and one, our current Secretary of Health and Human Services. And we're going to ask Monica Burrell, our former fellow, um, to do that introduction. So I want to start by introducing Dr. Monica Burrell, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, uh, where she was appointed in 2015. She's responsible for implementing the state's response to the opioid crisis, as well as leading the department's efforts in reducing health disparities, finding public health solutions for health care reform, developing innovative solutions using data and evidence-based practices, and other health quality improvement initiatives. She came to DPH. Uh, as a widely recognized healthcare leader and someone who had committed much of her career to underserved and vulnerable populations. She was previously the Chief Medical Officer of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. And this is the largest nonprofit healthcare organization for homeless individuals in the country. Dr. Burrell has served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, Boston University School of Medicine, Harvard School of Public Health. You're on a roll. Dr. Burrell. Um, she's previously at Mass General Hospital and Boston Medical Center and has practiced internal medicine in our area for more than 20 years, including in neighborhood health centers, city hospitals, veterans administration, university hospitals, and nonprofit organizations. She received her master's degree from Harvard School of Public Health. And as I said, she's an alum of our Commonwealth Fellowship Program. She did her medical degree at Boston University and residency at Boston City Hospital, Boston Medical Center. Commissioner Monica Burrell. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Joan, thanks for the introduction to my introduction. Um, so, um, graduating fellows, congratulations and welcome to the families, supporters of the program, and fighters for equity and social justice. Thank you for being here today. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, my boss, uh, Mary Lou Sutters, to you. She was appointed by Governor Charlie Baker as Secretary of Health and Human Services, which is the largest executive agency in state government. She oversees a $22 billion state budget, 12 agencies, including the one I serve in, the Department of Public Health, and has over 22,000 public servants in her um, EHS office, and she often knows where most of them are and what they're doing. EOHHS services directly touch the lives of all individuals across the Commonwealth. She is responsible, her responsibilities include overseeing the state's mass health or Medicaid program that provides health coverage to 1.9 million individuals of low income and disabled across Massachusetts. She chairs the boards of the state's healthcare marketplace which we call the Connector, the Autism Commission, and the Center for Health Information and Analysis Oversight Council. She co-chairs the Governor's Interagency Council on Homelessness and the state's first Governor's Council on Aging in Massachusetts. She is spearheading our efforts to address the opioid epidemic and efforts to reform and strengthen our Department of Children and Families. And I could go on. I hope you will ask her many questions and gain a lot of insight from what she'll talk to you about. Professionally, she's trained as a social worker. She's been a public official, private nonprofit executive, advocate, and college professor. She served as the Massachusetts Commissioner of Mental Health from 96 to 2003. Prior to her appointment as secretary, she was an associate professor and chaired the health mental health program at Boston College's Graduate School of Social Work. She's also served as an expert with the Department of Justice as a behavioral health expert. So really pertinent experience to what we've been speaking about here yesterday and today. She's been recognized with numerous awards, including the Boston Chamber of Commerce, Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation, Eastern Bank Social Justice Award, and from the National Association of Social Workers. She's an alumni of Boston University woo -woo, with a bachelor's degree with honors and a master's degree in social work and received an honorary doctorate from the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. She believes strongly in community service and has served on many, many charitable boards, including Pine Street Inn and the DentaQuest Foundation, the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. 
Personally, I have extremely appreciated her guidance and support in the work we do at the Department of Public Health. When we first met, I think we were scheduled for 30 minutes and spoke for about two hours about our shared interest in equity and justice. And she has been a strong advocate for our work at the Department of Public Health to use a precision public health model of using data to understand and inform our understanding of the social determinants of health and how they impact the most vulnerable among us and target our limited resources to those who need them the most in order to promote health equity. She is a fierce fighter for the populations we care very most about and the most vulnerable among us and is using her position every day to give a voice to those who don't always have one. It's my deep pleasure to introduce to you Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Perfect timing, Commissioner, just when I'm getting ready to do everyone's performance evaluations. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Have a little. So I'm PowerPoint free this afternoon and I hope that's okay with everybody. Oh, thank you, thank you. I can still do PowerPoint speak from having been a professor for a couple of years, but um, I thought what I'd do is just outline a few things, and one of my great joys in being with you is to engage. And so as long as you don't throw tomatoes at me, um, I'm, I'm a warrior, so I, um, I want to hear what's on your, what your questions are, what your thoughts are, the opportunities and the challenges um, that we face together. I want to thank you, Dr. Reed, for having me um, today. It's because it really is my privilege to be with you. I do have to say a few things about Commissioner Burrell, who is one of your alum. Um, so for those of you who are out there who think that, no, you never thought you might be commissioner of a Department of Public Health or wherever your path may go, that clearly the experience you have in this program opens many doors of opportunities for you, including the potential of being a commissioner of public health or perhaps a secretary of health and human services. And we need people like you in public service, um, people who have clinical backgrounds, public policy backgrounds, a lens that brings your expertise to government and public policy. Um, I'm a strong believer in individuals working, having many chapters in their lives of public service, a clinical practice, research, whatever drives you. But as I've often said to my own students when I was teaching, um, there are many doors of opportunity. It's often our own inhibitions that sort of don't open them. Um, so please know that. And I'm sure you're in the company of many people here who want to help you in your careers. Um, so it's true, um, I have been an advocate, public servant, agency executive, consultant with the Department of Justice, and yes, a college professor. Um, I really can hold on to a job. Um, these positions reflect my professional journey and different avenues of ensuring social justice and equity. When I talk of health, um, as Secretary of Health and Human Services, for me, I am talking about a whole person's health. I don't talk to, so for me, it's about physical health, it's about oral health, and it is about behavioral health. So I, I sort of reattached the head to the rest of the body a long time ago. So when I think of health, I can't really, um, even though we have segmented um, our healthcare system into oral, physical, and behavioral health, um, by policy, research, insurance, you name it. I really do think about um, health, individual health and community health. And this is what half a state government looks like. Here it is. Um, I often tell the governor I'm the best half of his state government because it is, well, of course. Um, you know, we could add education, transportation, and, and housing in there too. Um, I refer to them as my favorite one percenters um, since I am 50, I'm a little bit more than 50% of the state government. As Commissioner Burrell said, uh, it's a $21 billion, I only talk in billions and millions anymore, you'll just have to roll with me. Um, and I tend to be a little irreverent because the, um, the magnitude of what we do and the fact that we touch the lives directly of one in four residents of the Commonwealth, and when you think of our public health programs, they touch every person and community in Massachusetts. It is extraordinarily humbling. Um, 
because even with all of those resources, we know at this moment that we are still losing six people a day to the opioid crisis in Massachusetts, that we cannot resolve or mitigate every condition and human issue that comes to us, but we can treat every person with dignity and respect, and that's one of the things we need to do. And my irreverence is just how I manage my own stress when I sort of step back and realize all of that. Um, Commissioner Brown was saying I should say what a day in the life of a secretary is like. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that because I want you to be in public service. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we do provide access to medical and behavioral health care, long-term services and supports, and nutritional and financial benefits to those with low incomes. We connect elders, individuals with disabilities, and veterans with employment opportunities, housing, and supportive services. We steer troubled youth towards a more successful path and do everything possible to keep children in our child welfare system safe. We offer a safe haven to refugees and open doors of opportunity for immigrants. We support individuals who are developmentally disabled, mentally ill, blind, deaf, or hard of hearing, and those with addictions. I am tasked with setting policies and providing action on public health issues ranging from the opioid epidemic to the containment of infectious diseases to overseeing an ever-changing nursing home industry. I'm in charge with ensuring that our mass health program, which is our, our state's Medicaid program, is sustainable public insurance plus program now and for the future of the almost 30% of the residents of this state who have Medicaid as their primary insurance. We honor our veterans with gratitude and support, and we are taking appropriate steps preparing our great state to serve our growing older population with grace and dignity. Public service is a privilege. I've always considered myself a public servant, even when not in public service, because behind every dollar and statistic is a very real person. I remind people who work with me every day of that, because the numbers can become almost I mean, like when you talk about 1.9 um, million people or a $21 billion agency, right? It becomes just like numbers. And so I often remind people who work with me that data is extraordinarily important because that is what should drive our, our how we organize our interventions. But behind every one of those numbers is a very real person, a very real community, and people's needs are very different. So I react strongly when people talk to me about the mentally ill or minorities or the mass health population as if those are homogeneous groups. Because when I think about the mass health population, as many people refer to it, it's made up of low-income, non-disabled, and disabled adults, disabled and non-disabled children, youth, and elders. I never talk about addicts. You'll never hear me talk or ter use terms such as the mentally ill or addicts because I find it dehumanizing. They're individuals with addictions and addictions as we know so well from the opioid crisis. Addictions is not just one disease but a multitude of diseases and we need to treat the diseases with all, the, with all of our tools in our clinical toolboxes and not just have one size fits all system. So believe it or not, um, when I became secretary and as I was, is this helpful? Because I can do a song and dance, but you know, I'm tone deaf and I don't dance real well, so it won't be very pretty. Um, but when I became a public servant, when I came back into public service this time, um, it was extraordinarily important to me to recruit subject matter experts to be heads of public agents, or the public agencies that report to me and to also reflect the diversity and the richness that is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And still in this day, that takes an extra, extra work because they're extraordinarily gifted people in Massachusetts. And if you really believe in diversity and the richness of diversity and the richness of different people's perspectives, then you need to really engage in recruitment and to recruit hard. 
I understand as a white woman social worker that I'm probably pretty good at recruiting white women social workers, right? Um, and so that we need to really engage in order to recruit individuals uh, to come work with us in government. So when I first met Commissioner Burrell, well then Dr. Well, she's still Dr. Burrell, um, Monica Burrell, and what I thought was going to be um, maybe a 30 minute. I, I was I was like a headhunting firm at that point between the during the transition period time, and when I first heard about Dr. Burrell, first of all. She, Chief Medical Officer for Healthcare for the Homeless. So which resonates with me, um, having been involved with people who are homeless for many years. When I sat with um, Dr. Burrell, I realized this is someone who not only walks the walk, but talks the talk, understands the importance of disparities, understands, takes her clinical lens, understands precision data, and how we take data and how we take narratives to really frame public health interventions. The hardest thing that happened the day I met with Commissioner, with then Dr. Burrell, was when she left my office, I hadn't made a firm offer, and I really did want to lock the door and not let her leave until she said yes. But she needed to, she needed to think about it, and as a social worker, I can engage in a little bit of process. <laughs> Although my former students would say I'm more of a politician now than a policymaker. Um, but Dr. Burrell was very important to us um, coming to work in the Commonwealth to put a true stamp of public health. But even more important for me was bringing the conversation of disparities into the heart and soul of what the Department of Public Health is about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We often talk about numbers in um, state government, and there's lots of things for us to be proud of. So we have, for example, the highest rate of people with insurance coverage in the United States. That's very good. Pre and post the Affordable Care Act, about 97% of our state, state's population has health insurance, which is a really good base to start from in order to have the conversations about access, affordability, and availability, right? I'd much rather have 97% of our folks with coverage to have those conversations than in some states where we still have 17 and 20% of folks without coverage. And there's no question um, the, the lack of quality, shall I say, in those systems is extraordinarily different. But when you see that number, it's extraordinarily important to then peel away the onion, which is how I often think about public policy. Because in Massachusetts, while we have 97% folks with insurance coverage, I should sit back as the chair of the connector and say, hoorah, we're good. We're good in this state, right? But then you have to really dig deep. Dig deep. So we know, for example, that um, in Massachusetts, the uninsured are disproportionately young adults, Hispanic, and low income. In fact, although Hispanics represent approximately 10% of the Commonwealth's popu population, they comprise 20% of our uninsured population. So what do we do with that? Since I chaired the Connector Board um, two years ago, as we were doing our hurrah of, in terms of how many people had health insurance coverage in Massachusetts, I sort of challenged the Connector as they were about to do their marketing for the next year on, you know, trying to reduce the number of people with uninsurance was we couldn't do the same old kind of marketing because the same old kind of marketing that we were doing in our marketplace was clearly not reaching to those communities that still had high uninsurance within our commonwealth. And people looked at me like, so what does she, what does a social worker know about marketing? I may not know a lot about marketing, but I do know if you look at that 97% of folks who are, who are have insurance and the 3% who don't, that there are communities, there's zip codes of folks who don't have the same access to coverage. So we completely changed how we did the marketing within the healthcare connector. So instead of doing like, you know, these like sort of, you know, fancy glitzy things, um, we hired a company who was a minority advertising agency in Massachusetts to engage in a very different campaign, a house to house, a grassroots, working with um, neighborhoods, 
working with religious organizations, working with gas stations, storefronts. I mean, if I went through the statistics of how we changed, um, our targeted using data, we knew which communities had the highest rate of uninsurance and completely changed how we did the marketing for insurance. And in so doing, I don't know if I actually brought all the statistics with me, but in so doing, we actually made extraordinary, I, I was gonna bring that PowerPoint because that actually is pretty good. So we did, and in order to do that campaign, it wasn't a bunch of folks like me sitting around organizing the campaign. We paid communities to come together, right? Instead of just knocking up on people's doors, we paid communities and folks who lived in communities to come together and say, what are the barriers for us to get folks signed up for insurance? Again, Insurance doesn't translate into access, availability, and affordability. We know that. But again, it's a much better place to start having those conversations. So we ended up doing um, 2,658 Spanish TV messages um, in their markets. We did 917,000 digital impressions through ethnic media banners, displays, and the like. 56 online stories. Um, that ran on TV, radio, print, and digital media websites. We did uh, 26 radio interviews with Health Connector spokespeople and local navigators, which is very important to us. Interviews on Univision and Telemundo stations covering particularly Boston and Springfield. 18,500 multilingual info cards that were distributed in local businesses and community organizations and faith communities. This is not how you typically do insurance marketing, if you get the point here. 17, what we called Hidden Gems Tours, which was unbelievable, because we actually had people come up wanting to know if they could sign up for health insurance for that. We had the, so there's like 12 primary languages in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There's many more languages, but there's 12 um, in particular. So everything we did, it was with people who were bilingual, bicultural, which was not the easiest in signing folks up to do health insurance. The outcome of that was in 20 communities that we had really targeted with have the highest rate of uninsurance in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we increased coverage significantly. 45% of new enrollees were under the age of 35 and were within, were individuals who were bilingual and bicultural uh, in Massachusetts. A significant portion were individuals who for the very first time were eligible for insurance in Massachusetts. So that is just one example of how we, how we have changed what we do because we understand that 97% is great. But if that still means that there's huge percentages of individuals who don't have coverage from, from other communities, that we are not doing our job. The other, the other one example I want to give, and then I really do want to just sort of open it up for questions, is um, the opioid epidemic. So the opioid epidemic in Massachusetts, it's a Massachusetts problem, it's an American problem. And it speaks to the issues, in my mind, of disparity and stigma. We've had addictions in Massachusetts for many, many years. And in some ways, it wasn't until the prescription drug problem hit the white middle class that people really stood, sat up and paid attention. Because heroin has been a problem in a number of communities and disproportionately impacted individuals of color and marginalized neighborhoods. And those communities knew full well what was happening in their communities and finding their family members and loved ones getting treatment by being jailed. So we incarcerated individuals as opposed to providing treatment, and treatment outcomes. And there was no question um, that it was prescription drugs and people becoming addicted as a result of prescription drugs that started to change the perception of addictions that was long known in other communities within Massachusetts and across our country. So the governor and I have acknowledged that because it's very important if we wanna 
really talk about stigma and opening new pathways to treatment, that you have to acknowledge the history. If there's any good news about the opioid epidemic in Massachusetts is we have taken a complete public health approach to this crisis. Prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, we are all in in this fight. The gov we have put in, we've probably doubled the funding, state funding, and it also um, got additional, got a Medicaid waiver, and I'm happy to talk about Medicaid if you want to talk about Medicaid, and got additional funds from the um, outgoing Obama administration, President Obama's administration, to actually extend our Medicaid waiver to really expand access to treatment and intervention um, starting July 1st of this, of July 1st of 2017, beginning of our fiscal year. We use data and we use narrative. Data helps us hotspot, take our, take our resources to really target our interventions in the hardest hit communities. For the, how many people from Massachusetts or a lot of people here? Um, so there's 351 communities, municipalities in Massachusetts. 301 have had EMS response to an opioid incident, which means only 50 communities have not been touched by an opioid incident in Massachusetts. So we use data to help us formulate our interventions. And for the past couple of years, because of the negative trajectory of the opioid epidemic, we obviously have been focused on expanding access as much as possible. We need to come back on what I'm referring to as opioid 2.0, which is really focusing on prevention, really focusing on building resilience, really focusing on helping kids make healthy decisions, and on recovery. And really, it's Commissioner Burrell who's really been leading the charge of data and how we really focus on prevention and recovery. If there's any good news out there, and it's very hard because in 2016 in Massachusetts, there will be um, probably just about 2,069 individuals will have died from the opioid crisis. We are starting to see some um, positive signs, and there's probably four um, that I would mention to you. So one is that the, the, while the absolute number is increasing, the rate of growth of death is actually declining year over year. So from 2015 to 2014, the rate was 41%. The next year it was 31%. And between 2016 to 2015, the rate of growth is 15%. Um, so it's like maybe positive. Um, another one is, and it's very preliminary data, if you look at the first quarter of this calendar year compared to the first quarter of the last calendar year, um, there it is possible once we're done with all the predictive analytics that DPH does that we will see a slight decline in the number of deaths year over year. It's, the, all the reporters picked it up. I didn't even talk about it because it, to me it's too preliminary until we have the data. And the third is we've seen an extraordinary decline in the amount of prescription, um, prescriptions written in Massachusetts. We've seen a 23% decline in opioid prescriptions written. Hopefully it's not, we're not creating the unintended consequence of individuals who are suffering from chronic pain not being able to access um, medications for chronic pain. But we're seeing some positives. And the fourth is for the most part in our great state, people talk about addictions for what they are, which is a chronically relapsing disease, not a lack of willpower. There's still a lot of stigma out there. Um, one is because so many people have been incarcerated as a result of their addiction sort of engaging in sort of um, crime and the like to sort of, you know, find the funds to feed their addiction, if you would. Um, and we believe very much in access to Narcan as, as a harm reduction and not sort of enabling someone. But we have a long ways to go in our state to bend this trend. So two final things and then we'll open it up. Um, so someone asked me as I was coming in, so what's, what's it like to work for a moderate Republican? So one of the great things of uh, Governor Baker, uh, from my perspective, so this is my third return to public service uh, in Massachusetts, is he believes so much in bipartisan dialogue. So his cabinet is very, very reflective of that. 
It's Democrats, Republican, and I'm his independent, um, and anyone who knows me would probably say that about me. Um, but he believes, uh, so he's a policy politician, if that makes any sense to folks. I'm not here to like tell you whether to vote for him or not, but it's not, it's not about the politics side of it. But this is someone who takes data. He is very precise about data. He wants data to make the best decisions for the state. So he's a policy politician as opposed to a pure political animal. And what we're trying to do in Massachusetts is actually demonstrate bipartisan conversations and not engage in the rhetoric that all of us here talk, we hear about. And I'll give you just an example of that. When the American Health Care Act came out, first of all, we don't, we don't refer to the Affordable Care Act as Obamacare. Um, and it's not because President Obama should not be proud of a signature piece of legislation, but because it engages in rhetoric, right? It immediately politicizes folks. So we talk about the patient, right, the Affordable Care Act. And we would all say the Affordable Care Act is any complicated piece of legislation should probably be revisited and revised, improved, improved upon. We've done that in Massachusetts three times. We passed our version of universal health care coverage, and it was changed three times because having been involved in legislation for a long time, you almost never get it right the first time um, unless you're naming a building. Maybe if you name the building right, you spell the name right in the legislation, you've done just fine. Everything else, it's complicated. This is complicated stuff. So we've improved upon it. But have we ever been able to have the conversation about making improvements of the Affordable Care Act? No, right? It's repeal, replace. Get rid of, I mean, how many times, right? Repeal it. And so what we're trying to do in our state is demonstrate that in a state that's heavily Democratic with a moderate Republican, that we can work across the aisle, we can find common ground which is so important. And so when the American Health Care Act came out, we did sort of a back of the envelope, like figured out how, what the cost was gonna be for Massachusetts. Um, and I have this group of folks who work for me, um, and they sort of did a back of the envelope, and we figured out billion dollars in the first year, 1.4 billion in the next year, 1.9 billion dollars in lost revenues after that, and possibly up to a half a million people losing coverage. Um, so on any, whether you want to do the fiscal argument or the people argument, it was just not good for Massachusetts. And the one thing we did was we waited until the Congressional Budget Office, we came out early and said we were worried about this, but we wait till the con Congressional Budget Office scored the bill, which basically means like they determine what the cost is of the bill so that I couldn't be accused of Mary Lou math or Massachusetts math. And then we took the exact same calculus and methodology that the Congressional Budget Office used for us to say, this is the impact on Massachusetts. And I'm the governor's ghost writers. So those boring, some, a reporter said to me, you know, his health care letters are sort of boring. And I'm thinking, thank you, that's me. Um, because again, we try to stay out of the noise and provide the information for our congressional delegation and to the public. And that's how we will engage. And we hope by in doing that, at least every once in a while, in issues we care deeply about in our state, that we can sort of suggest that, in fact, we can have public policy discussions and not political ones. So let me just end on Medicaid and then hear what, I hope this has been a little helpful. So Medicaid. So when I came back to public service, um, I'm smiling now only because I, I remember this dearly one day. I realized that Medicaid, so Medicaid's 40% of the state budget. Okay. Um, and it was growing at double digits. So just to annualize the cost of Medicaid from one year to the next, you're talking like $1.2 billion. So just, you can just figure out the snowball, like how big that's getting. And I looked at this chart. I actually thought perhaps people had done the chart wrong, so I'm looking at the, the potential growth of the Medicaid program, I'm like, wow, this is like, like double digit growth every year. And I re remember thinking, maybe teaching health and mental health policy is a little easier than trying to operationalize health and mental health policy. And there are lots of things going on. So as a social worker, um, I asked my wonderful folks who work for me in the Medicaid program, Dan Sai, who's my Medicaid director, 
um, who is a volunteer at the Healthcare for the Homeless. So I knew in addition for him being really smart and coming out of McKinsey, he also had a heart, which was very important to me. So we engaged in a community conversation about what the Medicaid program should look like in Massachusetts. So we held for 18 months, went around all around the state, invited people to talk to us about it, anybody who wanted to have a conversation, more work groups. Some people thought I was just work grouping them to death. Um, but it was serious. What, what should the Medicaid program look like? And it was that that we submitted a big Medicaid waiver last spring, last summer, actually, um, to the Obama administration for consideration. Uh, and it was approved. That's the $45.2 billion uh, waiver that was approved in October. Um, that includes a restructuring of Medicaid to really think about the things I think probably many people in this room care about, which is physical health, behavioral health, um, a little bit of oral health, not enough. Um, and for the first time, a waiver in the United States includes um, funding for social determinants. Not enough, but an acknowledgement that we also need to address the other things that impact people, violence, trauma, housing, those sorts of things. So we built that into the waiver. I actually was stunned. Um, it was a hard fight to keep it in, um, but it, it remained in the waiver. So we have what we are calling flexible funds in addition to bring together some of the social determinants as we think about restructuring of the Medicaid program into more sort of a population model rather than a fee-for-service model. It is, um, in some ways, it's, an, it's, a, it's a grand bargain of Medicaid with all of its providers, um, with health plans, community health centers, community mental health centers, and the like. Um, and we also included about $1.8 billion in upfront dollars. If you, for those of you who are really into the policy wonky stuff, it's disrip dollars um, to help bridge from existing systems. It's easy for people to talk about changing systems. You need to have some funds available to help you actually bridge into a new kind of a model. So we're pretty scared and excited all at the same time about heading in that direction, which we will sort of be announcing in June, sort of these new models, these new accountable care organizations, and then a few months after that, how we will be sort of engaging with our communities around the financing of some social determinants as part of that. So with that, I hope this, I've not completely put you to sleep after lunch. Um, I want to thank you for what you do um, and your commitment to really believing in the health of everyone in our, um, wherever you are. There is a, um, I don't often use quotes because I'm always awed with all the quotes that everyone else usually cites, but the one that I'm sort of particularly um, aligned with at the moment is actually from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it is that the first wealth is health. And if we don't have health, if we don't have our health, the rest of what we talk about really is not going to be realized without health. So with that, thank you for what you do. I hope some of you we will see in government at some point in your careers and just want to thank you. So let me just open up for questions. Thank you for a very inspirational talk. Oh, um, thank you. I am curious about what you found was the, was, because it sounds like you had an informational campaign to address um, the lack of um, the, a lot of people in some communities signing yeah. up. So was that indeed the problem by um, putting all that information in? Was that the barrier that people were experiencing? And also, um, what mechanism, you know, you had the flyer cards, the yeah. radio shows, what worked, what worked best? Individual, um, truly it was individual to individual. So some of the barriers are um, fear of government. And seeing, um, thinking that the connector was sort of um, um, government reaching out to people. And, and I can appreciate people's fear of government um, and worry about that. So one was a fear, it was a small piece, but it was not an insignificant piece, was fear of government. Second was um, signing up for, you know, we do a lot digitally now, right, a lot online and things. Um, what became clear was we needed to make um, the 
ability to sign up for insurance, which is complicated, as everybody knows, as easy as possible for folks. And people wanted to sign up with hard copies and not go online and do it for the first time. Like it was like the, there was something about the paper process and the human connection was so important. And prior to that, I would say, because we're so technologically focused, all of us, I mean, I don't know about you, but I probably have five things called that start with an I in my bag there, um, right? But for people who were signing up for insurance for the first time, it was the tactile experience turned out to be so important. So we had all this call center stuff going on, but in fact, what was, we needed boots on the ground. I mean, that's really what worked. So we had people from their communities, we signed up to work with us as we called navigators or connectors and did, it's real community organizing is really what it was. And that was probably the most effective, um, uh, was boots on the ground and not saying to people, okay, we're gonna have this big sign in day at X community health center, which did work, but it was really going out to, I, I actually went to a couple and they were actually in church halls. That was actually some of our best places where we signed people up, right? Where it's, co co where it's comfortable for you as opposed to convenient for us is one of our messages that we learned from that. Yes, sir. Yes, Brian Son, we met earlier today. Yes, we did. And He's um, going to yell at me about oral health. Of course. <laughs> yes, about oral health. Yeah. But you're invited to our symposium that's going to take place. I know you have a busy schedule, but the invitation is open because you're okay. going to get a different perception of oral health. When we talk about oral health, we don't want people to stop with just teeth. We, no. It's a much bigger picture. So as you've talked today about disparities in health care, mental health, no. you mentioned oral health as well. We talk about social determinants of health. If you ask the public in Massachusetts what would be some of their top priorities around health care, oral health would always fall in the top three. I know. But I'm advocating that we need to have a state dental director. And we need to have that yeah. even if we have to find the funds privately. It's just that important when you have so many issues around oral health, the creation of dental therapists. Is you have my commitment, we'll do this. All right, well then let's do it. All right. <laughs> Enough said. All right. That's usually what I say to somebody, say thank you and just. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Don Lee from uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yes, and I know we talked about what, what it's like to work under a governor and yeah. from, from a Republican, a Republican. And basically, my question is, uh, and thank you, you can, for you can say that. Thank okay. you, thank you for answering it. Thank you for answering it. Um, so basically, I was wondering about care coordination and the social determinants of health. And this, you know, we live in a we work in a fee for service model, the docs. And I'm a hospitalist, um, so I'm salary based actually. So I don't. But I should I, say, you're not fee-for-service if you're a hospitalist, right? Right, right. But basically, you know, the, um, we're moving towards a value-based system, and, and whatever, what keeps coming up is care coordination, um, whether it's transportation, those sorts of things. And I'm wondering, with this extra money that you're going to use, are you going to, maybe I'm answering the, asking the question wrong, but the money goes somewhere. It's either going to go, I mean, in terms of the vehicle, whether it's a, a new government program, a health plan, that will execute, or the actual healthcare system, or an ACO, I mean, the list yep. goes on, and how do you plan to, with that extra $45 billion, or you can go, you know, how do you plan to allocate that, those funds? So, um, great question. Um, so care coordination is the, uh, the heart of um, a value-based accountable care organization, um, and, I sort of kiddingly say to some of my colleagues, for me it's like a full employment act for social workers. Um, on a more serious note, it is the, it, it is, and care coordination can happen in many different ways, but there needs to be someone for whom um, the client, the patient feels is their navigator through what is a complicated system. And we are, decoupling 
Um, lots of people have pieces of what they would call care coordination, but actually dedicated in the ACO model are paid um, care coordinators. It could be a community health worker, it could be a social worker. Of course, being a social worker, I'm obviously biased, but it's okay, I can be open to other ideas. Um, uh, but some, and someone who the patient feels is their connector. It did, at this point, does not include families, in the, it doesn't include a family paid family member for a whole bunch of complicated CMS rules, which I was unable to convince my friends at CMS um, in the waning days of the outgoing administration that maybe, you know, family paid caregivers could be actually a care coordinator, but um, there's a whole bunch of arcane Medicaid rules which I will not put you to sleep on as to why I could not win that argument. So that's, that's to us the heart of this. And we'll be announcing probably 18 or 20 um, um, ACOs probably around, I think it's around June 19th of this year. So uh, I will, I'll tell you a funny little story in this is, so as we were going through this model and we were putting it out to bid, the governor one night said to me, so what happens if you put this out to bid and no one applies? Do you know what that's like? I mean, so I didn't sleep for days. I was like, <sighs> Um, the reality is we were home for about 15 applications. We got 21. And about 85% of the Commonwealth's uh, current lives in the Medicaid program would be covered by that. We were hoping for 50. So we're, we're, we're feeling, and it's really a great um, mix of hospital systems, community health center systems, and some very interesting um, models out there. So I'm be happy since you're in Wisconsin. And no, we're not going to tie drug, drug uh, urine screens to Medicaid eligibility in our great state, nor employment with Medicaid eligibility. It might work in Wisconsin, and we'll follow you. It's not, it's not our state. So thanks. Uh, so this is a very practical question. I, I served on a local board of health and recently was part of a, a collaborative with uh, local boards of health in Massachusetts for emergency preparedness. And it, it struck me, and I wonder what your view is on this, that uh, local boards of health, in addition to being relatively under-resourced, mm -hmm. uh, are not really utilized to the maximum extent to improve the health of the communities in which they serve. And there's a lot of will there. I mean, I, I was a volunteer, right? I did that on my spare time. So we have an expression, waste no will. And I'm wondering, how do you see the role of the very, by, by the way, we have this very, for people who don't know, very different board of health situation. There are many, many more in, in Massachusetts than in most states. So, you know, it's a, it's a great, um, that's a great question because I, I um, I don't disagree with you that the local Board of Health are sort of an untapped gem, that somehow we've created a number of other sort of community groups and coalitions out there. And one of the things I've said to Commissioner Burrell is we need to take like all this, all these community coalitions and try to find better ways to connect them together. And I've, I mean, this is an area where I need to learn more about why Boards of Health, like in where I live, my Board of Health is very active. Um, and yet in others, they're not as active. And so I haven't quite understood like what the disconnect is out there. And so I would welcome you into a conversation with Commissioner Burrell and me. So as we try to, f no, no, I'm serious. As no, we try I'm, to. I'm serious yeah. too. I think it would be fun yeah. because very often it defaults to restaurant uh, no. inspection and flu clinics. Yeah. And there's got to be more but than the, that. But it's right? like you should be the local board of health yeah. um, and really connected to community. So I would welcome that conversation. Yeah, be fun. Thank Thanks. you. Anybody else? I put you all to sleep. I actually, I have a hard stop at 120. There's this tall guy. He's about six foot six. I have to go see at two o'clock. Hello. Hi. My name's Rhea Boyd. I'm one of the Commonwealth Fund Mongan Fellows at the School of Public Health. Yes. And my question was around some of the flexible dollars you were talking about for social determinants of health. Yeah. I think there is a tension when health systems are thinking about some of their flexible dollars to either buy or build to either pay community-based organizations to do the work where the dollars might yep. end closer to the community or to give the money to health systems who will then build something unique outside the community potentially. Can you talk about how sure. you will deal with that tension? Great, great question. Thank you for that. Um, so we explicitly built into um, the RF, our, 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 our competitive bids that went out that the um, the incentive is to buy and not build, and that you can build only if you can demonstrate that there is not a community service program that's out there. It was quite explicit in the RFR, and I won't name names, but there have been some 
systems, shall we say, some vertically organized systems um, who have really had a difficult time with that because the inclination is to build in their systems. And we have a rich diversity of community organizations and community health centers and community mental health centers and whole lots of others, um, you know, non-traditional uh, agencies out there that should be part of whatever these new systems look like. So we explicitly put in there that, um, uh, and I was pretty, I'm not adamant. People say I'm tough, which I really sort of react negatively about. I think I'm just determined every once in a while about a vision, and that was one of them. And I will tell you, there have been some, it turns out a couple of my former students are working for a, I know this only, you know, by this, uh, just as an aside, are working for a, a healthcare consultant company, and they basically feel like they're doing group work between some of these vertically organized systems and some of the more community-based organizations to try to find the language to come together. And I think that's a good struggle for them to have. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Bott. I'm an internist geriatrician with, and with the American Hospital Association and had a former life uh, at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Yes. Um, a but, former uh, chapter. Former chapter. <laughs> uh, but uh, the thing, the one piece that I work a lot on is trying to uh, strengthen clinical community connect, uh, linkage mm -hmm. um, and, and to help uh, organizations do that. So I, I want to ask a question about leadership. Um, we know that we're fortunate um, to have gone through this experience and and um, have leadership lessons from it. And if you were to say, um, uh, if I would have, if you had the chance to go back and meet the secretary when you first started, a month into your role, is there something you would tell her uh, differently? Um, and and another option is that you've had leadership experiences that have been robust across different sectors. Are there a couple lessons that stay true across yeah. different um, environments. And thank you for your service and no. leadership. Oh, please, thank you. Um, so one of the, um, there's really a couple of lessons. Uh, one is you don't have all the, all the answers. And I am very quick I'm very good at asking questions um, and and saying I don't have the answer. Um, and anyone who has all the answers to everything, it must be like the most brilliant person out there. But I'm really good at sort of asking questions and saying I don't know what the answer is, but I we will figure this out. And um, and that is a very true. And it's just it's just who I am. So I will ask a lot of questions. I also, the governor will say this about me, and um, it was very kind of him, and it is true. I will never ask someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So um, as the commissioner knows, we have, we have worked on some things that had very tight timelines. And if, if I'm asking you to stay and work on a, come in on a Saturday or work till very late at night, it's because I'm going to be sitting right there with you. And I just... I have too much respect for people um, that I will not sort of sit in the same seat and do it. Um, the, the third one is, and this is, and this is a leadership thing, is um, as you go, if you, uh, the more responsibility you take on and the greater, the, the, greater uh, the position you take, is you find out that there are a lot of people tell you what it is they think you want to hear. And as you see today, um, I don't travel with an entourage. I, I do have someone who dropped me off and is going to pick me up. Um, but I, I really, I like, to, I like to be out. So it's really important for me to come out and hear people's truths, um, for me to take it in, um, because that is how we together will solve um, problems. And that, that's really important to me. I like different perspectives. I like all sorts of different perspectives. Um, and that, that's probably one of them. The one thing I would say is um, when you, the first month you become secretary, is <laughs> you find out you're about to become a subject matter expert in a whole bunch of things that you have never even thought about before. <laughs> um, and it's like, literally like, really? I need to know this? Um, but on a more serious note is um, you have to give up 
a whole lot. I'm a control person. Like I am an operations person in my heart. I am now Secretary of Health and Human Services. I'm responsible for $21 billion. I have 22,000 employees. I have 12 agencies under me. I generally only deliver bad news. I only generate bad news, right? I mean, health and human services, right? Kid and, ch child, kid and child welfare, someone runs away from a juvenile justice facility, you know, a bad thing in the Medicaid program, you name it, right? Um, and so one of the things you have to do is you have to release your control and completely trust the people who work for you. And for those of you who are type A personalities out there, I can't tell you how hard that is. Um, but you have to release and allow other people to run, you know, r run public health, run mental health, and for me to provide the leadership for them so they can, I manage the external stuff so that they can manage their agencies. And I have to tell you, that is really hard to do when you're like, well, let me just like read this document again. So you get the last question and I'm running out the door, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, number one, Octavia Martinez, uh, Executive Director of the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health from Texas. Uh, also a former fellow uh, 2002. Yeah. I'm also on the National Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Health on Rural Issues. Um, which brings me to my question, which is, how do you, in, within your 1115 waiver and what you presented sounds really intriguing what Massachusetts is going to do, but rural health usually gets second shrift. And two, you know, we don't spend enough really on the HS, on the uh, part of HHS, right? Very much is spent on H, but very little on HS. Yep. And so we've been going around the, the, uh, the United States and meeting in communities, uh, rural communities, and they all seem to be saying the very same thing. A lot of it is obviously the economics. But aside from that is, they're sort of really going, where is the HS part of HHS? And I'm just wondering from your perspective, what do you plan to do for rural Massachusetts in reference to, to that perspective? Because that's where the, at least for other uh, areas of the country, the opioid crisis is really very hard in rural America, as well as the fact that, you know, and it's all those issues that we know about, transportation, access, and the list goes on and on. Oh, it's great. So one of the, um, one of the great, uh, one of the opportunities in New England is that we are uh, tight geographically. So you can literally get from, well, if you drove with me, I won't tell you how fast you can get from Boston to, to, uh, the, um, to the New York border. Um, but we are, so we're a state where we can um, get from like in two and a half hours, border to border. That's not driving with me. Um, uh, so, so the geographic tightness actually pretty much means that all communities are considered here. So I do think the geography helps us in these in the rural, urban, suburban um, conversations. Uh, we have there are parts like Berkshire County, which is like landlocked by mountains. Like when you over go and go over Mount Greylock, you then pop down into Williamstown. The, the, the access issues are around transportation um, and some human services, but we don't have, we have lots of issues. Um, but the human services, um, maybe because I'm a social worker, I don't ignore the human services side because the Medicaid could just run me over, right, on any given day. And I think the fact that I was Commissioner of Mental Health and I really do pay attention to the other parts of human services, I think where our challenges are is education and healthcare and human services. I think those, we have a lot more to do in really connecting our education systems with health and human services. But it's a longer conversation to have. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, as you're, as you're leaving, because you've got to put your pitches when you can, and, and, and you did such a great job asking about the dental, but as this moves forward with the waiver and the social determinants, what I want to say is this is an area where our fellows have expertise, but also a great deal of interest, and I hope you'll allow us to engage and work with you in this. All right, fellows, you heard. You heard.